A lot of people are already in the stream. 503 Menagerie. Looks like I can't go back. Abby, somebody was there, but before that I didn't see. Um, okay, let's see. Vicabulous is here. Ashley, Nebel, 503 Menagerie. Um, Aqua Garden Zen. Okay, excellent. I think I think that's everybody that I can go back, back far enough to see. So welcome, welcome. Um, Sandy, Sizemore, Wendy Hickson, and Cassie. Excellent. Getting some more people in here as well. Lovely to see that. As you can see, I have a guest with me. This is Ruby, my uh, red-sided garter snake. And say hello, Ruby. Oh, oh, a little shy, I guess, but uh, <laughs> nice tie. Thank you. Yep. Um, Ruby is my largest uh, garter snake and my only female red-sided garter snake. So um, she is going to introduce one of the questions that we have from Patreon and, and help me answer it. Okay. I'm going to start out with that question because it relates to snakes and we'll see how long she wants to stay here. Oh, you can kind of see her color there a little bit, huh? Can you see the red on her, her red side and her red sidedness? You see that? Um, Sean Meister's here as well. Oh, you know, I should probably move this light. It's, I use that for unboxings and filming close up stuff, and it doesn't really need to be here, so there we go. Young lad's here as well. All right, so this is a question from Ashley Nebel. She says, um, What's your opinion on? Brumating the snakes, or brumating snakes in general. So I thought I'd answer that uh, here about Ruby. Last year was my first year brumating snakes. Um, I think the year before that I had, yeah, these these guys were too little to brumate. Well, you could have, I could have brumated them, but uh, I didn't because they were really young and. and some people opt not to do that the first year, but the second year I did brumate them. Basically, I think with garter snakes, it's not necessary to do it to breed them. This is, well, that's, that's what they say. It's not necessary to cool them, but you do improve the quality um, of the breeding cycle, I guess, so that uh, you're likely to get a larger broods, more fertile, um, more fertile eggs that end up being more, you know, more garters born. So her first year of production, she produced 22 babies. One was stillborn and 21 were healthy and um, all went to new homes. So that's pretty good for a first year for red sided. Uh, and partly that was due to brumation, most likely. If I had, hadn't allowed her to brumate, probably wouldn't have had uh, production like that in her first year. And red sideds, this. A lot of red-sided garters, meaning the, not the California red-sideds. So this is Parietalis, it's not Infernalis. A different subspecies, same species, different subspecies from the California red-sided garters. They uh, tend to come from much cooler climates than the California red-sided garters. This particular locality is Montana. So you know the winters are going to be long and they're going to be cold. And these snakes do seem to um, want to brumate quickly. I mean, they, they sort of start thinking about brumating even in September a little bit. So I have to work on them to get them to eat uh, after that. And like, uh, when was it? It was a week or a week and a half ago or something. She took one medium mouse and, and a fuzzy and then she took a couple of fuzzies uh, the day before Halloween. And then I stopped feeding them because uh, you need to give them about a month before they go down. Uh, to kind of purge their system. So you give them about two weeks on normal temperatures. They have a basking light and everything so that their metabolism is still working. They're passing all the waste for a couple of weeks because you don't want any food in anywhere in their gut uh, when they're brumating. And then you give about two weeks. Um, and then two weeks with cooler temperatures, cooler like room temperatures, no basking light. And then after that, you put them down for brumation. So in the beginning of, uh, December, right around the 1st of December, she's going to go down for brumation. I think with this particular subspecies of garter snake, it's highly beneficial because I don't know what I would do with the adults 
uh, if I weren't brumating them because they basically try to brumate anyway. Um, and like I said, these are from a pretty uh, harsh winter climate. So that's true of these. With some other garter snakes, you probably don't need to do that nearly as much. I know that I was talking to Don and he says he cools his plains garters for only about a month and then they're good to go. Of these, on the other hand, I cooled them for approximately three, three months. So uh, I hope that answers the question. I think with, with garters specifically, it's, uh, it depends on the type, but it can definitely improve their uh, reproduction. And with a lot of other snakes, it kind of depends on the species a lot, depends on uh, how serious you are about breeding. There are a lot of pet snakes that don't necessarily need to brumate at all. If you don't, uh, you know, you're breeding them, then you may want to uh, allow them to brumate to improve the, the odds that you're going to get more fertile eggs, that kind of thing. So I hope that answers the question. That's, uh, that's kind of my take on it and my experience with it so far. So, I see Moon Over Miami and Chris the Mad Aquarist. Hello, thanks again for letting me use that uh, Porcelio Hoffman's Egg Eye video. Uh, that was awesome. And Mike Fernandez says, Ruby full grown. Well, it depends on what you mean by full grown. Full grown meaning mature? Then yes, she's reproductively mature. And uh, if you mean full grown, will she grow more? then she will grow more. Um, snakes don't really stop. They do slow down a lot, but they never really stop growing. So she's going to be growing for the next, you know, however many years she lives. She's about three years old, I guess. So uh, she could live another seven years. She could live another 10 years, maybe even. Uh, and she will continue to grow, but at a much uh, reduced rate. So... And yeah, and like Sandy's saying, it's advisable to wait two years to breed blue tongue skinks. And yeah, a lot of animals can breed at younger sizes, but it's just, it's nice to wait a little longer, not, not hurry things a little too much. And that's kind of what happened here. So, let's see. And thank you. She is kind of a lovely snake, isn't she? I, I think she's awesome. She's so docile. She's, oh, she's dirty. Look at that. I, Got a little patch of something there on her. But she's a pretty big garter. I mean, there are garters that get bigger, but she's actually pretty big for her species. When I looked up the stats for this subspecies of garter, they usually don't get quite this big. So she's fairly sizable. Let's see. And okay, great, Ashley. I'm glad that that answered the question. So Vicabulus has a question about brumation too. Where do you keep them while they brumate? I have a plastic tub. I've got it at Costco, I think. It's a black tub with a yellow lid with a few ventilation holes, small ventilation holes drilled in it. And then another hole drilled for um, access, electrical access into it. And what I do, and I actually have a video about this, if any of you, um, if any of you moderators would like to make a link to it, that could be cool. Um, it's called, if you look up Aquarimax Brumation or something like that, it'll, it'll pop up. If you want to drop that in the in the chat. But basically, I put a layer of leaf litter. Leaf litter is magical stuff and it works for snakes as well as isopods for a lot of things. As a kind of a buffer, temperature buffer. And then I put a sheet of polystyrene lined with mylar as sort of a, a way to keep the, um, the heat from getting too far away from the snake container. And then I put a bin, a locking bin. It's an iris bin. Iris weather tight, I think it is, kind of bin. And I have that drilled for ventilation as well. And under it, I have a Viz... What's the brand? It's the one I get from the bean farm. Can never remember. Ultratherm. Ultratherm heater. Um, under, under tank heater, basically. And I have it on a low thermostat, which you can get online fairly cheaply, uh, so that the temperature um, from the heater is about 50 Fahrenheit, 50 degrees Fahrenheit. And that, of course, rises into the enclosure. It's... It, uh, was under about half the enclosure. So I got 50 degrees on the warm side of the enclosure and it went down into the 40s and even the high 30s on the cool side of the enclosure. So the snakes um, could still thermal regulate, but never above, well, initially I had it at 55 degrees when I first put them in there. And then after they'd been there a while, I reduced it to 50. And it's pretty cool thermostat. It even has a, a little alarm on it. So if it gets below a certain temperature, a little alarm goes off. 
and or above a certain temperature you can set that and so this is in my garage and it uh, during the winter you know it's that it's somewhat thermally protected but it, not enough that I can't that I can't do it without supplementary heat so I have that heat pad as kind of a fail safe in case it gets too cold and which it does sometimes and that keeps them uh, nice and chilly all winter I keep the leaf litter a little bit damp inside the uh, tub so there's the big tub and then inside is the little tub the snakes are actually in and in that tub I also have some leaf litter that I keep kind of damp based on um, what's his name he's a, a garter snake breeder in uh, the Netherlands I can't remember his name but based, using his methods and they came out great I woke them up March 1st so they they went in the first week of December I can't quite remember the day but it was the first week of December and woke up on March 1st and within a week they were ready to eat and they were mating like crazy they've been mating all crazy since June they've been mating like almost non-stop it's crazy so she may well have stored sperm and uh, be ready to produce a clutch uh, in the spring whether or not she mates but uh, at any rate they will uh, start eating after about a week and mm, they're good to go so that's kind of how I do it and oh Valerie couldn't roommate the corn snakes because was on antibiotics so well, it's smart not to do it in that situation so team I haven't heard of the team C's fundraiser all right Wally well great to hear it glad you're listening in she is kind of a pretty snake I, I know people have said that but I just can't get over it she's she's pretty I really like the red side it's one of my favorite garters and thank you Chris and Sandy for putting the brumation video links up there both of you did it which is awesome <laughs> so don't toss them in a burlap sack and toss in the crisper some people do a method very similar to that um, I know Don Don of Don's Garter Snakes he puts his in the fridge I and some of them he, he also can cool his his main snake room if he wants to the way he's got it set up we were talking about that when I was over there um, so if he wants to he can cool the whole room but when he really wants to cool something uh, fast or separate from his main room, he can put him in the fridge, and he does. And Thomas R., it's Albatross Gaming. Excellent. And Kevin Zay, welcome. Good to see you in here, Ben Slusher. And I agree, getting some trash out of the oceans is a good idea. Kevin, you're going to be breeding the uh, Crested Gecko. Who are you going to do some pairing today? Awesome. Let me know how it goes. <laughs> my husband would leave me if he found reptiles in the fridge yeah yeah that we have a, a lot of us have significant others with that sort of feeling about it um, I don't think my wife would be particularly pleased but luckily I have a mini fridge that's a reptile and bug mini fridge I keep my crested gecko diet in there and I keep my night crawlers in there and I keep cactus pads and whatever you know all the kind of crazy weird stuff that I use I keep there so um, my, I got this little fridge on the, you know, online classifieds, and it's worked out nicely. I really like it. It's down in the, the basement by our deep freezer, and come in pretty useful. Keep all my supplements like calcium and stuff like that in there too. Just last longer in a, in the fridge, so it's pretty good. Oh, Ashley's isopods have their own fridge too. Awesome. <laughs> Labeled the container is something you know full well he wouldn't open. <laughs> Unless he sleepwalks and then, he, you know, he might open it anyway. You never know. So, young lad, the new lumpy froggy friend is growing fast. So my daughter's little uh, Pac-Man frog, he looks like twice the size he was when we got him. And I don't even know if that's possible. I know they grew fast, but he's big. So pets are my life. How long does a garter snake live? It can vary quite a bit, but uh, maybe seven to ten years is a pretty good ballpark figure, something like that. So, uh, and you know it can vary, but something like that. Aqua Gardens and got the catchy. That's for um, getting taking care of fungus gnats and, and other little pests, uh, flying pests specifically. And sounds like it's working well for you. So that's great to hear. 
Oh, Kevin. <laughs> Open your freezer and saw a bag of hamsters from Rodent Pro. I can imagine that would be something. Did your friend keep hamsters or is it just the fact of finding hamsters? <laughs> okay, so a couple more questions. Lacey says, do you have any tips on how to move the isopods only out of a culture? I've got mold spores in the substrate of my culture and inevitably all new leaves added get moldy. I just need to start over. Any expert tips on moving tiny monkey easier? I tried a paintbrush, but they won't stay on. So, a um, couple of things. One is that Ashley actually chimed in. Ashley Nebel uh, chimed in with an excellent suggestion. So, she said, I use this silly thing because I have a lot of micro and dwarf species. Ice cream tester spoons. They have just a small indent for a spoon and are thin enough to slide just under the isopod. Got 100 off Amazon for about $5. So, that's awesome. I think that's a great tip. I was actually going to suggest a small spoon, but now I don't have to because Ashley did. And specifically, the uh, ice cream sample spoons, because of the way they're shaped, kind of spatula-like, it's pretty, pretty hard to beat that. So thank you, Ashley, for an excellent suggestion. And Random Tea, Super Chat, $5. I think that's uh, Canadian $5. Excellent. Is it required to spray ice spot enclosure with dechlorinated water as tap water? Fine, I keep forgetting to ask. So I'll tell you what, Random Tea. I know some people probably spray with tap water. Myself, and I don't really spray per se, rather I more trickle on the moss more than I spray in almost all cases. But uh, I would say that it kind of depends on your tap water because some tap water has basically, you know, it's, it's some tap water is pretty safe, some of it's full of chemicals, some of it varies depending on season or depending on what's happening with your municipal water supply. So they might do a spike of chlorine and so you might be fine for a while and then they do a spike and that might not be so fine. So I never use straight uh, tap water. I use filtered water. It has gone through a carbon filter from the tap through a carbon filter and then I use that. And that's usually what I use. So the, as long as, I think it's better to be safe than sorry, I guess, in a case like this, and that's, that's what I do. I, I just never use straight tap water. It's either been dechlorinated or I'll use uh, purified water or it's just gone through a carbon block, something like that. So I hope that helps. And Mr. and Mrs. Morelli are in the stream. Welcome. Good to see you here. And Seachem Prime Water Conditioner, I use that for my fish. And um, if I weren't filtering I, the water through a carbon block or a carbon filter, I probably would use Prime to prepare the water for my isopods. Filtered treated water, yeah. So Kevin does uh, basically the same thing I do. Great, yes, I think that's a good, we're getting consensus on that, that's, that's good. So Thomas R, isopods like pumpkin. Yes, they do. Um, I, I give my isopods pumpkin and they really go crazy for it. I think bottled spring water uh, is, is, is okay. It's probably an expensive method, but it could be used in most cases, I think. I mean, look at it and see how it's treated. Reptisafe is a good one as well. All right, I'm gonna go back to Patreon for a few questions. Ashley Nebel says, I just noticed my Ornatus high yellow had some offspring, but only three. Do they usually have small broods? And then she had an update. Um, it says, I noticed two or more, so a total of five together today. So um, five is kind of small for a brood for Porcelia Ornatus in my experience. I think uh, one thing to keep in mind is that Porcelia Ornatus does have larger uh, babies uh, in proportionately than a lot of other isopods. So a newly born manca of uh, Porcelia ornatus is a lot bigger than, say, Armandulidium vulgare, and is even proportionally fairly large for some of the larger Mediterranean Porcelia. So their broods are not gigantic to start out with. But I have seen broods bigger than, than five for sure, maybe like 15, 20, something like that. And that's, I'm kind of shooting from the hip there. I didn't count exactly. I'm just thinking what I've seen. Another thing is their survivability can be affected by the types of shelters they have. In uh, Oren McMonagall's book, Isopodzoology, he talks about this with this species specifically with Porcelli ornatus. He likes to put stacked twigs 
and things like that for a lot of surface area for them to hide and molt in, and that seems to improve their survivability. So uh, that may be something you could consider, of course not stacking them so high that they can get out, but maybe stacking them in there and seeing if that improves the survivability of some of the uh, monkey in the, in the very early stages. And Sandy, I think um, letting your water sit in an open jug is a good idea if it's chlorine. That will help. I almost lost this lady. Careful, Ruby. Um, and if, you, uh, if it's chloramine, it doesn't really help because chloramine does not uh, evaporate readily. Chlorine does. So depending on your municipal, municipal water supply, well, she's really in, into everything, isn't she? Sorry. Uh, losing some visibility here. Got to adjust that. That's why I have them on a lanyard. Um, so if you have chloramine, that probably won't help a lot, but if you have chlorine, it'll certainly help. And yeah, this, these garters, of course, I raised them from little ones. Not all my garters are this docile. <laughs> she is super docile. All my, uh, actually, all my red-sideds are. My trio, my reverse trio of red-sideds are super docile. But I have uh, a pair of Plains garters from Dawn that I, they were older when I got them and I haven't worked with them as much. They are not as docile. They're coming down, but they're not as docile as, as these here, which are crazy, just laid back. So. And Fishaholic, hello. Um, let's see. Let's see, one red spotted, one hybrid, and one checkered. The checkered is probably that chill. Okay, cool. All right, so yeah, the stack twigs may, may help a little bit. I hope so, Ashley, with those. So let's see, more questions? Oh, Sandy had a question the other day. I think it was posted to Facebook. I'm trying to catch up on uh, some things that I miss outside of uh, Patreon as well, and I can't catch everything, but Sandy had a question about why Porcelio scabert lava is my favorite morph of that species. And I think it's just because there's some crazy contrast and intensity with the color and pattern, and uh, also that it's a co-dominant. It appears to be a co-dominant morph. So that's interesting genetically, but it's also visually very striking. Even for me, with my partial color blindness, um, I love how it looks. It's just, it's an intense contrast. So it's really fun for me to be able to see that. And Toilet Pete, hello, pet time, greetings. Hmm, let's see. All right, got some other questions here. Uh, okay, two more here that I can see. Lacey had another question about terrarium plants. She said, terrarium plants, which one should you avoid if you have isopods in there? I had a nice variety of plants in my bioactive until I added isopods, and they happily ate the roots of a few. In addition to tasty plants, are there any poisonous to the isopods? Well, a couple things here. One, I wish I could give you better information. There are so many plants kept in terraria, and there are isopods with different preferences, and I'm not sure of all the toxicity of all the terrarium plants. Generally, I think isopods do well with most plants in bioactive vivaria, but I, I've never seen a case in my particular, in my vivaria, where isopods are eating a plant that's healthy. I'm not saying that's not what happened in yours. It's very possible that that is what happened in yours, but they will attack plants when they feel like they're dying, definitely. Um, but I don't know, it may well be that they were eating perfectly healthy plants in your uh, vivarium. The only thing is, there are so many possible combinations of plants and isopods that I feel like I can't give you a lot of quality information on that question. I wish I could, but I feel like I would have to be uh, an expert in all vivarium plants and an expert in all isopods interactions with those vivarium plants, and I'm afraid I'm neither. So. I wish I could give you better information. That is a great question. And another question is about, and I'm not sure who left this. I remember it and I went back to look to find it. I thought it was here on Patreon and I can't find it, so I'm not sure. But it was about 
sexing isopods. So you may notice the picture that went with this live stream was um, a picture of a male and a female isopod from underneath. So you can see the pleopods and you can tell them apart. Uh, might be a little bit hard to do in a thumbnail. But what I've done is in the description to this video, I have posted a link that goes directly to the section of one of my videos where I explain how to sex isopods and it goes into more detail about looking at the shape of the pleopods in the male and in the female and some other ways to sex them. And it is my video on selectively breeding isopods. So whoever asked that question, I hope you see this. I hope you go to that link in the description. And if anybody, uh, any of the mods would like to copy and paste that into the uh, chat, you're welcome to do that. That would be great. And you can check out how to sex isopods. It's, it's a little bit challenging to do, but it is quite possible if you had good eyes and or some magnification. And especially if you have a transparent container, you can look at them from underneath. And carrot cube, I hope those prunosis uh, juveniles show up soon. <laughs> and Thomas R, I actually haven't seen a, those, those attacks, those spamming attacks for some time. I'm not sure what happened there. And... So Kindle 4444 are talking about the, uh, the, the varium plants that I recommend that seem to be fine with isopods. Yeah, yeah. Um, in my experience, um, philodendrons have been great. Um, Neoregelia bromeliads have been great. Um, the aglonema, the Chinese evergreen, seem to be fine. The snake plants seem to do really well uh, with the isopods. I'm trying to think what else. I've kept in there. I've done the, I think it's the fat cheddar plant, the, the, the hybrid plant. Um, done well. Uh, rabbit's foot fern has done well. Hmm. Those are, those are some that I found that have done well, just off the top of my head. And hopefully that helps. It is a great question. Pets are my life. So what is the best size tank for dairy cow isopods? Well, whatever it is, it's going to be too small soon. Most likely, unless you have a method for dealing with large numbers of isopods. Are you going to hang out there for a second, Ruby? Um, I should be checking the chat on my phone, but I'm not. So I'm touching the screen. Some people are really bothered when I touch the screen of the phone or the, the iPad so that I can look at the chat. But that's all I'm doing. I'm just looking at the chat and I'm not sure what else to do. Uh, other than that, so uh, it can be difficult and challenging to uh, follow the chat if I don't do something like that. But I can try looking at my phone if that helps. You can see that. So let's see. So pets are my life. Uh, you can certainly start out with a six quart tub for dairy cows if you have a fairly small number of them, somewhere between say 10 and 25. But um, you're going to need to upgrade fairly soon, and no matter what size container you have, you might find you have too many unless you have something to do with them, some place to put them. So, all right, Osman, hello from the Netherlands. That's great. Oh, so carrot cube. Those are wild prunosis. That's pretty cool. Yeah, and so I'm, I'm kind of, uh, along with Thomas R. Here. The isopods can eventually outgrow just about any container if you're not doing something to, to curb their population in some way, which can mean control the amount of food they get. Um, it can be using them as uh, bioactive crews in various places, all that kind of stuff. <laughs> just get a really long stylus. There you go. But... That could work too. Oh, I can hear myself talking. That's weird. Through my phone, you probably can't hear that. Hopefully, you're not hearing the, the banging and everything that's going on upstairs. There's uh, people doing dishes and stuff up there. So uh, I'm right under the kitchen. And I hope, I hope you're not hearing that. <laughs> so. Yeah, but, yeah, this is kind of working. I can. Uh, 
Well, if you covered your entire room in leaf litter and let them loose. Kind of like that, uh, what's that YouTube channel, Reptiles Uncaged, I think it's called. He did that with, with reptiles. Oh, is Ruby messing with the mic? Oh, darn. I, I was thinking about that earlier and then I didn't, uh, kind of forgot about it. So I should move her. Let's see. So that's probably Ruby making the, the microphone all staticky. She's rubbing up against the mic, so I should move her out of the way. So the Juliana 90, can you recommend a type of beginner eye spots for a toad vivarium? Well, um, kind of depends on what kind of toad. Most toads really like isopods, like to eat them. And so something that breeds quickly uh, wouldn't be a bad idea. And or something that you, uh, well, best case scenario, you will be breeding those isopods outside of the toad vivarium and keeping them in, just adding them. Well, my microphone just fell apart. And, oh, thank you, Mike. I appreciate the super chat there. My, my mic just totally fell apart. I guess I'm going to be ordering another mic. Uh, I just lost the, the pop screen. I'm trying to find it. I think it fell. There it is. Can you still hear me? <laughs> well, I knew this one was on its way out. I just didn't think I was going to die right now. Maybe I can pop it back together for a little while. The clip it just got kind of weak. Well, maybe that'll work for now. Okay. So, to the Juliana 90. Um, some isopods, you can also look at isopods that uh, bury themselves a lot. Uh, things like giant canyons. Uh, or dwarf whites, or Silisticus convexus that will spend a lot of time underground and um, be less likely to be eaten. Some of them will probably be eaten, but some of them will be down in the substrate. Um, so Kevin, as far as feeding dairy cows to your geckos, if your geckos will eat them, they're, they're a pretty healthy uh, dietary addition. They're, have, they have some natural calcium in them already, so that's nice. You know, a lot of feeders uh, don't have a lot of calcium and think we have things like phoenix worms that do but many of the insect feeders don't have much calcium in them and uh, so your isopods do and gut loading them can only be helpful I have occasionally fed off excess uh, isopods to my leopard gecko and I've fed isopods to crested geckos in the past and morning geckos will pick them off in a bioactive vivarium so yeah uh, mini geckos would benefit from something like that. <laughs> yeah, I think the super chats from today are going to help me get that mic. I, I do need, you need to buy a new one because this happened. So I don't know how many mics I've actually gone through. Uh, oh, there's another one. Excellent. Thank you, 503. Um, I can definitely buy a mic now. I have enough money from the Super Chats alone today to get a mic. At least, well, I, I, what is it? YouTube's going to get their cut, but it'll, I'll be close anyway. It's new mic season. Excellent. Yeah, I ought to do that. So, um, Candle, you've got the... Um, Dairy cows attack some purple velvets. Is that the Gynura species of plant? Is that the, the genus name, Gynura? They destroyed the roots and left everything else. That is really weird. I wonder what was going on there. I, I haven't heard of that until now. Oh, thank you, Aqua Garden Zen, for the Mike Fund super chat. And Linda Rodriguez used to play with garter snakes when she was a kid. Blue, green, and some red striped ones. Awesome. Oh, okay. So maybe the mic, Mr. and Mrs. Morelli are saying maybe the mic hung on the bottom of my shirt until it fell. That could be. That could be. So pet time. I actually have a good video on, well, I hope it's a good video. I have a video that I made uh, about... Uh, P. prunosis, focused on the care for that species. So mods, if you can pull that up, it's in the uh, isopod care guide playlist. It's one of the earlier ones that I made in that playlist. If you could uh, throw a link up here in the chat, that would be awesome. 
So yeah, carrot cube, don't have any reptiles, you can feed your dairy cows, okay. Well, that's fair. Um, the jury's still out with some isopods, you can help control population by feeding fewer, uh, less leaf litter and, eat, and more feeding more supplemental food. That can reduce breeding in some species. Not sure about dairy cows, it doesn't work with every species. I haven't tested it with dairy cows yet, but uh, it's actually worth a try. So, let's see, have you grown succulents before? Oh, you got some lithops, those are the living stones. I have grown some succulents, in fact, I have some now. I have a, a jade plant that has been in the family for probably over 20 years. And I have another one that I've been growing for maybe 12 years. I have a, a dwarf jade plant, the um, Portulacaria afra, that I've been growing for probably more than 10 years and quite a few. Um, okay, it is January that you were talking about the purple plant. Okay, yeah, I haven't had a lot of experience with that one, so I'm not sure what happened there. And cat, welcome, and I will keep trying to do these um, live streams every week. Okay, so bric-a-brac, wondering about humidity settings and balance for isopods. So the key here is that I don't have any technology for measuring humidity in any of my 60-something isopod enclosures. What I do have is a gradient. So on, the, on one side of the vivarium or enclosure, I have more ventilation. On the other side, there's a lot less ventilation. There's still some on most. Mm. And then on the side with less ventilation, I have my mossy spot that always is kind of damp, always kind of moist. And then the other side gets drier. And then you have hides all along the way and the isopods find that good balance. They find the spot they need when they need it. And then you don't have to stress about it. So hopefully that helps. That's, that's how I would say. Make sure you've got that gradient where it's drier on one side, you've got the moist moss on the other side, and then takes out the guesswork because the isopods are going to do that for you. And there went my mic. I apologize. It's really dying. It's dying hard and fast. You see, I'm going to make a little modification here. This might work, might not. Okay, right after this, I'm going to order a new mic. Right after this. Okay, when rehoming my Cali mix early, I missed most of the grays. I found the bin still with gray, stayed mostly gray, where the ones rehomed have nearly no gray. Ever seen this on localities? I've heard about it happening. Um, so we were talking about this in a stream or in comments or something a while ago. Uh, someone was saying that, was it Santa Lucia that does that or something? I, I'm not sure if it was Santa Lucia or Punta Cana. I think it was Santa Lucia and the... The tangerine, Armadillidium vulgare tangerine, was isolated from orange individuals taken from uh, either Santa Lucia or, or uh, Punta Cana. I'm not sure which one. So apparently things like that can happen. I'm not sure how many generations it took to isolate the orange, but it sounds like for you it was very fast. Can you put dairy cows in your leopard gecko tank with cypress mulch or will she get them? Hmm. Well, that depends partly on your leopard gecko and partly whether the cypress mulch is going to allow you to create enough of a humidity gradient in there for them. Uh, some leopard geckos, okay, just to put this out there, leopard geckos vary quite a bit individually in what they will eat and what they will not eat. Pardon me. <coughs> <coughs> My leopard gecko has a cleanup crew composed of Porcelionides prunosus uh, and uh, superworms, largely. There's a few mealworms in there too. But the superworm beetles are a big part of the cleanup crew. And she doesn't eat them. She's not interested at all in eating the beetles. She will eat the larvae, and I've seen her grab larvae that are growing up in the enclosure, grab them and eat them. She will not go after the... Um, not go after the adults. But I've heard and talked to people who say that their leopard geckos will joyfully munch down the... Uh, the beetles. So as far as the dairy cows, it really depends on your leopard gecko to a large extent.
And that is, uh, Kevin, I think that um, that generally tends to be true, and it depends on what kind of humidity you have. Um, for example, if you had a, a moist hide that you always keep mothy, I think the leopard, uh, in your leopard gecko enclosure, you might have dairy cows that would do okay, but you'd need that. Uh, for sure, something like that. And if you don't have something like that, definitely I think it'd be too dry. Because much of the enclosure would be. So cat, what do I do with isopod cultures? If they get out of hand? Mine really don't because I sell so many of them. I've never really had to deal with uh, crazily overcrowded cultures, but um, I have, like I said, fed off a few here and there, but Generally, it's just selling them. And yeah, they will eat the moss to an extent. I noticed that some people say, oh, they never eat the sphagnum moss. I see them eat it. They do eat it. And um, making sure that they have... Uh, what I like to do now, uh, recently I've been doing this, is the mossy spot doesn't have anything under it. There's just moss all the way down to the bottom of the enclosure. On, in the mossy area, and that seems to, uh, you do need to replenish the moss uh, once in a while, but that's what I've been doing. And Kat says, does anyone know succulents harm isopods? I don't know of any succulents that do, although there could be pesticides on them that could. Oh, speaking of uh, teachers and isopods, I'm going to get to go to my daughter's class in a couple of weeks and bring some isopods in, and uh, probably some other creatures, maybe some snakes, we'll see. Uh, maybe pseudoscorpions, I I'm trying to decide what I'm going to bring in. Probably an assortment of various creatures, and that'll be fun. She, when I suggested to the teacher that I bring some in, because she had mentioned she was interested in isopods, and I said, do you want me to come in and do a presentation? She was really excited about it, so... Um, I, I, w I was thinking of suggesting to her that I could bring in a couple of cultures of isopods for her to keep in the classroom as well, if she wants to. So, we'll see how that goes. <laughs> Hit the dad lottery, huh? I like that. I'll go with that. Sounds good. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited about it. It should be fun. I'm just going to jump into Patreon to see if there are any more questions in there real quick. Sometimes they come mid-stream, literally. Um, okay, I think, I think I covered all of them. Yep, good. So far. So the Oniscus ocellus I collected are starting to multiply. I found them in my basement, of all places, under some lumber. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> well, that's good. It's good if you're getting them breeding. Um, they can be a little touchy at first, but it sounds like you've got them dialed in well enough. So it's not a problem. So, uh, cat. Do I have millipedes? I do have a few millipedes. I have some uh, Spirostreptus species 1. I have some uh, bumblebees, I have, let's see, some Narcissus, a few Narcissus Americanus, and I have Hiltonius pulchris. I think, I think that's it, what I've, what I've got right now. I've had various species of millipedes in the past. Uh, the first one I ever bred was flame legs. I miss flame legs. I wish I still had flame legs. I've had ivories and bred ivories too. Don't currently have any. And I had some uh, Mardonius. Parilis acuticonus, a very large African species, not as big as the A. gigas, but still a pretty big uh, millipede. Can any plants grow in cypress mulch? Well, there might be some that would try. Uh, my recommendation would be to put them in a more uh, plant-friendly uh, substrate in a pot and then just put the cypress mulch around them if you're going to do that kind of thing. And 503, it just depended on the millipedes. I got my uh, flame legs when I started with those. I got them, they were quite young. So it was about a year and a half or so before they were breeding. Um, I've had them breed much more quickly, depending on the species. I think my Hiltonia's pulchres were pretty fast uh, breeding. 
Um, bumblebees are usually about a year old, I think, before they start breeding. And so it just depends on uh, the type. But hopefully yours will be breeding soon. And ivories are honestly one of my very favorites, 503, so I hope they are breeding for you soon. They, they're usually pretty, pretty straightforward to breed in captivity. I had uh, a few generations of those, I think. So Tony Frederick, good deals on isopods right now. It's not, not too bad of a time to get them uh, at this point. It's getting a little late because it's starting to get cold and then you're starting to have to pay express shipping and so on. Personally, I'm going to be shutting down my shop temporarily for uh, in mid-November until somewhere in mid-January, uh, partly for just because the weather and also because during the holidays, uh, mail gets ridiculous and there are lots of postal delays and that's just not safe for the isopods. So um, even with Express, I just prefer not to worry about it. And uh, it also gives me a break to catch up on some other projects that I need to do. Uh, so, but right now you can still probably find some, especially if uh, locally you might want to consider going to a reptile expo if you have those around where you are as well. You can usually find some good isopods there. Then you don't have to worry about permitting if it's in your state. So, yeah, carrot cube isopods are, I mean, millipedes are, are really cool. So Sandy would like to know about best temps for isopods again. Getting colder here, mine are at 68 to 70 now. I would say for most isopods, you don't need to worry. For some of the tropical ones like Cubaris, uh, Nezodilo, that kind of thing, he might be getting in the cool range. But for anything, uh, for almost everything else, even dwarf whites, will be fine at cooler temperatures for a while. They'll slow down in breeding. A lot of them will slow down in breeding in temperatures like 68 to 70. Uh, and even, but most isopods can get quite a bit cooler than that and be fine. So unless you're working with tropical species, I wouldn't worry about it at all. Um, but like I said, some of the Cubaris and Nesodilo and stuff like that, you may want to try to stay closer to the mid 70s. But Really, my, my temperatures in my isopod room get down to 65 in the winter. I've never had a problem. It, it does slow down the breeding for some, but it's, you'll probably be fine. Oh, aquatic gardens then. I, I've had that happen too, where the, the ivories nibble on your finger. Okay, so your, uh, your ivory millipede seems to be pretty much full size. You could get babies any time then. Just keep your eyes open. Hopefully you will. Let's see. 22 Celsius for Os Osman. Uh, let's see. How, how warm is 22 Celsius? I forget. I used to be better at converting, but I'm kind of out of practice, so I just use the Google. 22 Celsius to Fahrenheit is 71 degrees. Okay, so Osman, that's a little cool for optimum breeding of your um, dwarf whites. Uh, I would see if you can get them up warmer. I usually, for maximum breeding, you know, for really fast breeding for that species, you want to about 80 Fahrenheit, maybe 82 Fahrenheit or something like that. So Thomas R., if you're thinking of starting to post on your channel, make sure it's about something you're passionate about first. So think about what you really want to post about before you go any further because um, it's difficult to keep up uh, posting. And so it has to be something you love. For me, I love talking about critters. And so it's a lot easier for me to do that than it would be if I didn't love it. But if I were talking about something I didn't love about, I, would, I didn't love, I wouldn't be doing it. I would have given up a long time ago. So. That's the first thing to think about. Might be obvious, but um, it is something to think about. And cat, that's a good point. The dwarf whites are probably burying, burrowing quite a bit. So Sandy with Cubaris Marina, I would worry less than some of the others because Cubaris Marina is uh, found, you know, in Florida and places like that where it gets quite a bit cooler than 70. So you're probably okay with Cubaris Marina. I'm thinking more about the truly tropical ones. So pets are my life. 
Have you kept mollies? I have. I've kept and bred mollies. It's been a while, but uh, balloon mollies, I think, are kind of cute, but also I kind of feel sad that they've sort of made their, sort of deformed their bodies, I guess. Um, I think some of the more, less uh, modified mollies are, are, I prefer them. And the live stream usually goes about an hour, cat. So we've got about 10 more minutes-ish, something like that. Yep. So yeah, so Osman, if you can do about 80 degrees Fahrenheit or 26 Celsius, you will see an increase in breeding. And it's true that they, they are quite secretive and tend to burrow and hide a lot, but uh, Temperature does make a difference. I always notice in the summer I have a boom of dwarf whites when things warm up because I keep uh, in the summer my critter room is about 78 Fahrenheit, so nearly 80. It's probably something like 25 Celsius or something. Uh, so, cat, any advice for whites? Um, tree frogs. Um, I haven't ever kept White's tree frogs. I've kept other tree frogs, but uh, yep. Okay, Mr. and Mrs. Morelli, we got a super chat. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. So are garters your favorite snakes or is it like your favorite isopods? Um, okay, well, I want to answer this fairly. This is a great question. I love garters, of course. This little lady, you can see she's, she's pretty personable, pretty fun. I love some things about garters that are kind of rare in snakes. One of the things I love about garters is that they are communal. And there aren't that many snakes that are truly communal. Garters are truly communal. They actually tend to do better when kept with other snakes. She lives with two male garters. Um, I'm actually thinking of doing a, a sorority and fraternity enclosure, so a 40 gallon breeder size enclosure with my males, maybe up to four males in there, maybe six males actually in there and then up to four females in the 40-gallon, uh, uh, in the other enclosure. But they're truly communal. So I love that about them. I love the fact that there are so many interesting natural color variations and so many interesting morphs. There aren't near, near as many morphs as there are, say, ball pythons or corn snakes, but there are quite a few interesting ones going on. And I like the fact that they're not that expensive and that they don't take up that much space. I like the fact that they'll eat quite a wide variety of foods and that people who don't want to feed them rodents don't have to. I do feed mine rodents because it's easier, but you don't have to. So I would say though that I love lots of snakes. I haven't kept a huge variety of snakes. Uh, I've only really kept seriously as an adult because when I don't really count when I was a kid and I went out and caught snakes for a little while and kept them. So I'm not counting that. I've only kept three species of snake. And two of those species are garter snakes. And I think I'll always love garters and always want to keep garters. But there are so many snakes out there that I want to keep that are on my wish list. I want a super dwarf reticulated python. I want um, a black milk snake. I want, I, I could just go on and on and on and tell you all the snakes I want. Um, so I guess it is like isopods. It was a long winded answer, but snakes are my favorite snakes. And every snake that I meet, I love it in general, and, and I want to keep all these different kinds. I, there are so many different snakes I'd love to keep. Uh, I, want a, I want a boa of some kind. I, I think a rainbow boa, Colombian, or not Colombian, a Brazilian rainbow boa would be super cool. I think a um, big old leucistic rat snake would be cool. There, I could just go on and on and on. Love snakes. Um, various pythons, I think, are really f fantastic as I'm sure you're aware, looking at your name, that uh, <laughs> you can appreciate some, some pythons and things like that. So yeah, I guess, I guess you're right. It's, it's like isopods. My favorite is too hard to, to narrow down. Okay, so Tima, I have several fish. I've bred probably 25, 30 different types of fish uh, and kept two or three times that many different species. Uh, currently, I have a tank, a breeding tank of Neolamprologus multifasciatus. I have some, which are shell-dwelling cichlids from Lake Tanganyika. I have some uh, blue star endlers from a Venezuela locality. I have some goldfish. I have a 
let's see, have a super red bristlenose pleco. I think that's all for fish right now. Not, not a huge number of fish. I think bull snakes are fantastic. I just hear that uh, their their pooping habits are kind of hard to deal with, but I love I love to look at them and their personalities. I love hoggies too. Um, haven't had one, but they're they're pretty fantastic. See, I'd I'd totally get some tarantulas too, but my wife won't let me. But I, if I could, I'd get a green bottle blue, a couple green bottle blues in a second. Oh, the blue phase Japanese rat snake. Those are awesome. And thank you, Aquatic Garden Zen, um, for uh, coming in. Snakes are my favorite snakes. Best sentence I've heard all day. And yep, I, I thought so, Mr. and Mrs. Morelli. You'd have some, some pythons for sure. Oh, rosy boas? I love rosy boas. I would love to keep rosy boas too. I could just keep going. And... So, Brickerback, you have some books, magazines about animals to recommend. Well, I'm always recommending, if you're into isopods, Oren McMonagall's book, um, Isopod Zoology. That's a great one. <laughs> Cat trying to split the screen with video and work. So, I think a lot of you are in the same boat as I am. It's just, there's so many animals and so little time and so little space. I just, I find myself wanting so many different things and thinking, I can't. I don't have the space. I don't have the time for so many things. Usually adding a few more cultures of isopods is easy because um, one, what's one culture of isopods when you have 60 something? Uh, it's, it's really pretty uh, minimal addition, but uh, with uh, higher maintenance things, you know, and things that require a lot more space, like snakes. The only reason I don't have a like, uh, super dwarf reticulated python, well, there's the cost, but there's also the space. I don't have the space for it right now. Oh, you got some unexpected bald pythons. That's awesome. I've often thought that would be a great one to go with, too. And I love the fact that the rosy bows will live in slightly cooler temps. Um, that's part of the reason I think it would be fun to have a, a black milk snake, too. And I love snakes that will just hang out with you, you know, like this one. Um, let's see. So, cat... I think the isopod beads that are harder to tell with male and female are the really fast moving ones. You don't get a chance, they're super hard to pick up and, and check. Like uh, Adlantosha floridana or Silisticus convexus. It can be pretty hard to just nail them down so you can see what's going on. Um, usually it's not a problem because you get a number of them, you start with a number of them, they're breeding anyway, so you don't really need to tell them apart, but it can be tricky to do so. So pets of my life, kept cardinal tetras, yes, I actually had a planted uh, 20 gallon high with uh, CO2 injection with a nice group of uh, cardinal tetras in it years ago and uh, unfortunately I lost them when I moved but uh, the, the moving stress that that whole ordeal was too much on them but they were very cool and it looked beautiful with the the CO2 uh, injection and all the, the plants it was, it was a fun tank I missed that So Kevin, yeah, my son really wants an Argentine tegu, and I, I think that would be super cool. And sulcatas are awesome too, but huge. Uh, fortunately, uh, I've been able to go visit both at Clint's Reptile Room. He's got a sulcata in there, he's got an Argentine tegu, and, and it's so fun to visit with them and all their other creatures. That's for my birthday. What I wanted to do was go down to the Clint's Reptile Room with my family and hang out and uh, hang out with Clint and hang out with the creatures down there and that's what we did. That's what we did for my birthday. I, I uh, got a face to face with Clint and it was so fun. We got to hang out with uh, so many cool snakes. I had snakes draped around all my family members and they loved it and I loved it. So fun. And Osman, that's true. You get the, a room suddenly filled with isopods. That's what happened to me. When I moved into this house, I had maybe four or five cultures of isopods, and now I have 60-something. Yeah, I love the, the colonial aspect, too, like I was saying before with the garters. 
and that they can eat fish. It's kind of fun. I, I generally don't offer mine fish, but when I was raising the babies, some of the babies were picky eaters, and the picky eaters would eat fish. So that's what I offered them as I was getting them used to eating other things. Most of them I got them transferred over so they would eat other things as well. Where do we put a lizard that big? Yeah, basically you have to have a room-sized enclosure for that. Yeah, I love Gus Gus. He's so fun. And yeah, Clint's, Clint's fantastic. I am, I'm excited for uh, every time I get to go work with him. We've got a couple more videos coming out pretty soon, so keep your eyes open for that on his channel. Two more videos that we haven't released are coming out. I'm not, I'm not sure exactly when. Uh, but one of them I got to see the like the, the rough draft of it and it's usually not too long after the rough draft comes out that it's come, come out so just keep your eyes open for that you ever visit keepers in Florida Charlie I haven't done so yet I'm not opposed to it um, I, I would totally do that I've only been to Florida once and I didn't really know anybody there at the time so, um, but I, w I would totally do that someday if I have a chance. Oh, snake discovery is awesome too. And Kevin, very good point. Uh, that's part of the reason I feed uh, rodents because they tend to have less stinky poo when you feed them rodents as a main diet. Ooh. Candle 4444. Stinky fish poo is gone pretty fast in the bioactive. Oh, good point. So I'm, I'm excited for a Clint's live stream. We gotta check that out. Everybody who, everybody should go to Clint's live stream when we have that. Oh, Tyler Nolan. Yeah, I remember seeing uh, Clint's video on Tyler Nolan. That seemed like a cool thing to do. That'd be fun. I, uh, I've really enjoyed being able to do what traveling I have. I mean, when I go to visit Clint, it's not a lot of traveling. It's only a little over an hour for me to, to go there. But it was really fun uh, uh, to do, and I, I love it every time I go. And I look forward to the next time I go. It's, it's just so much fun every time. It never gets old. We are always doing something amazing. Um, also, this summer, it was really fun to meet in person Peter from Bugs in Cyberspace and Jesse from Shapes in Nature down in Arizona. That was a lot of fun as well. Uh, just fantastic trip, getting to see all these critters that I had never seen before in real life and getting to hang out, so another fun thing. 503, that's probably worth a shot. I'm, I'm guessing you'd get some takers on the guinea pig poo if you put them in isopod enclosures. Let me know how that goes, I'd be interested. And, oh, so yeah, Kat, I'm glad you you were able to catch this stream. And, Clognog, yeah, the garters are pretty widespread. This particular species doesn't occur in my state, but it does occur in a lot of places. And it gets up pretty far north, um, into Canada, and Alaska even, I believe. So some, some uh, millipedes you can try. Ivory millipedes are a good one. Bumblebee millipedes are a good starter. And I guess uh, I actually need to go. I didn't realize it was so late. I, I, I stayed past my uh, time. So I've got to go. Um, working on a video for a couple weeks from now. But uh, maybe Clognog, we can have the Pac-Man frog in the next uh, live stream. So, and yeah, Springtails with millipedes really helps. Fungus gnats can live and eat, uh, live on and eat millipede frass. They can't do that so much with isopod frass. So fungus gnats can be even more of an issue with millipedes than they are with isopods. So this video will be saved to YouTube. I'm not sure how long it's going to take, but I will let it save up to YouTube. So thank you, everyone. I appreciate the super chats. I'm going to go buy a new mic right now. Um, everybody stay healthy, stay safe, uh, and I'll see you next time.